Yeah. Bruno, how you doing? Welcome to the sticks tape. I'm coming from the Bel Air Reservation, Minnesota state. Yeah, it's the natives up north, stepping the res, of course. Never forget us, we never defeated, we never surrendered, we never retreated. No, this one's for the Chairman Floyd, also for my brother Sam. This is another jam of the motherland. Uh, I put on for my tribe. Say me quits, leech, and the language will divide. This one's for them single parents, all they on their grind, and all the little Nietzsche's with the skateboard on their grind. This one's for my homies that I lost in 05, and all my brothers in the struggle with the hustle stay alive. This ain't for them disrespectful Nietzsche's, no, not at all. This is for them younger Nietzsche's trying to play some college ball. I'm trying to leave behind stories, bro. I want to start a winning tradition, 94 warriors. Hi everybody, welcome back to the Maui Disney Show. This is Nicole Bakinage. And I'm Shirley Narendra. And today we are starting a four-part series that we are calling Humor is Medicine. And uh, we are interviewing Mr. John Roberts from the Red Lake Indian Reservation. I like how I emphasize that. Indian Reservation. Um, <laughs> the Red Lake Nation. Chippewa. <laughs> Took away. <laughs> <laughs> so, when we began talking about doing this four-part series, Shirley and I, we, we actually just stemmed from a discussion that we had a, a while ago, was how humor is very much medicine for Anishinaabe people. And I remember being a little girl and getting teased because I was chubby or whatnot, or because I had poor clothes on or whatever, whatever it was. She told me, you better laugh at yourself before somebody else does. And she would say, all the time, if one of us kids would get mad, if we were getting teased more than the other, she said, you're not a Ojibwe unless you can laugh at yourself. And I, I didn't really understand what that really meant until I became a parent myself and I say the same thing to my children. But I guess it's things like that that really reinforce the idea that humor is medicine for Anishinaabe people. So that's why this whole idea of birth that we would, that we would um, have a four part series with this. And over the past, the course of the past few years, we, it's, it's become a, a more public and more reoccurring thing that we have local people who are doing comedy. It's not new to us, but it's new to us that they are, have the courage to do live performances. And it, I, I couldn't get up in front of a large group of people and make them laugh like you guys do. But I could try, but I, you know what I mean? It's definitely an art and it takes a skill to do something like that. So when we thought about doing this series, we thought about yourself, we thought about mm -hmm. Keto, we thought, you know, and, and these. Yeah gentlemen that are to complete the rest of the series, but I guess we wanted to ask you on your personal journey and how you came to doing live performances and, and really putting yourself out there like a, yeah. like a comedian. Yeah. Well, um, grew up in Red Lake, had a lot of, I don't want to say crazy people, but they were, they didn't care what people thought of them, they just expressed how they felt. The main one, the main one uh, that I admire, looked up to, is my uncle Joe. He'd always make everybody laugh, and there was just uh, something about him, like a presence. He was, it's all, it was always a calming presence. I remember we had a big tornado up in Red Lake. Everybody was scrambling around trying to seek shelter, and there's my uncle Joe just standing there, cracking jokes, making fun of everybody, running around, crying. Like that. And, and I was like, you know, liked the way that you know, the way he seemed, that cool, calm, joke around, keep everybody keep everybody under control a little bit. And then from there, my stepdad, he brought a lot of uh, Richard Pryor VHS tapes home. We'd watch those. Well, I'd sneak watching them because when I was six, seven years old, I should have been watching them. <laughs> and he had, uh, I remember he had an Eddie Murphy cassette that I'd always take from him. When he wasn't around, I'd listen to it. In my bedroom, you know, Eddie Murphy, the mid-80s. Kids shouldn't be listening to that, but I did. And, like how the, the crowd reacted to him. 
And then as for really starting performing comedy, I was about, I think like 2009, they had a Native American showcase at BSU. You know, singers, dancers, whatever, whatever you have to show off. Your talent, like figure, you know, I must have checked that out. I was on the comedy since I was a kid. I went over there, I didn't do very good, but it, it, it just the, the rush of the crowd, yeah. you know, what a couple jokes worked, that was that was enough for me. And, and yeah, just, so do you remember one of your jokes that worked? Um, not offhand, no. no. I was so nervous. <laughs> I just I, I was pacing around like I still do that on the stage. I, I pace around and I try to keep it, you know, keep it flowing. But, it's just hard to, the hardest thing about comedy for me is uh, the days leading up to a show. You know, once I get on stage, I'm fine, but just leading up to getting up on stage is the hardest thing for me. My wife, she, she avoids me the day of a show because I'm like, really, I'm really hard. You're not that funny. I'm not that funny during the day of a show. I just I like to stick to myself and go over my notes and listen to music and just whatever that, you know what I'm doing. But then, I, I was bothering uh, Res Dog Jordan up in Red Lake. He was a uh, marketing manager. And uh, I saw he had a couple of comedians coming up and told him, hey man, I'm ready. And I was just joking around. Man, I'm ready. It's kept on like that. And then he finally called me up about four months before that first comedy jam. All right, you're on the, you're on the card. And I didn't think I was ready. I thought it was a joke. And the day, day of it came, I got on the stage and I did okay. So. And, uh, living off that for quite a while now. Just the rush. The mm -hmm. rush right. So do you get nervous when you do when you do the smaller events? Oh, those are the worst. Are they? Yes, really? I, you uh, look so natural at my wedding. <laughs> yeah, that was, well, that, was, that was big. I've done, <laughs> I've done crowds like eight, nine people in there and just total dead silence. I, I just keep going through, keep my stuff done. and. I suppose the odds of reaching out to nine sets of humans is a little yeah, bit more challenging. Yeah. Than I get that down in the cities a lot. I go to open mics. You know, a lot of the, you don't see Native Americans doing their open mics down there. Everything I do is new. It's kind of like they're, they're scared not to laugh, so they're like, you're just laugh. <laughs> yeah. so sympathy laughs? Yeah, they're just sympathy laughs. That's pretty much what I get down there. That's awesome. I'm sorry, I get to hang it down there, so. So how is it like, um, I remember reading one of your posts on Facebook about you were surprised that your jokes went over so well in a predominantly white crowd. How does that go over? Because I mean, the Indian humor is Indian yeah. humor, like it's something that we we get. Yeah. But we're like in, you know, we're embedded with that kind of. Humor. I think it was just uh, most of my jokes are about my family life and uh, working. You know, everybody can relate to stuff like that. But uh, I put a little Ojibwe-ness in it, I suppose, and the people really got into that. That was in a black bear. That's the first time I've been paid at a, well, even though it's at a casino, mm -hmm. they, they only bring in the, like, the headliners yeah. from around the country. Like the guy I opened for, he, he was on Colin O'Brien like a couple months ago, yeah. and you know, he, he liked all my jokes. And it was surprising to hear that, because down in the city, it's, like the sympathy one. Yeah. Get a lot of sympathy <laughs> out of yeah, I remember this, that the last Ojibwe, Ojibwe, what do we call it, the Ojibwe Jam? Yeah, Ojibwe Comedy Jam. Yeah, I read at the palace here. I thought that one was probably the best one. Yeah. Honestly, I was like non-stop laughing. I think I lost, I'd like to say I lost a couple of times laughing. <laughs> but it was so funny because I must have been in about the fifth row. And the front row is like, you had a young Indian couple in the middle, but it was straight white fishermen like tourists, like mm -hmm. straight tourists, and they would kind of look at each other like they had to like <laughs> agree to laugh almost, but then they wouldn't really laugh, and I'm like, that is hilarious, <laughs> and then the raunchiest of the raunchiest jokes come up, and they're hysterical, I'm like, what is it, you know, like, yeah. does it have to be a certain degree of raunchy before it's hilarious, for I was like, oh man, it was good stuff, though, it was, it was, it was awesome. Kurt, so, I remember the first ever all Ojibwe comedy. Yeah, and I remember Curtis worked very hard to try yeah. to get that. Yeah, we really did good bringing us all together. It was a lot of fun. It was really good. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I thought, you know, that would have caught on with other casinos, you know, first thing, you know, one of the first times that ever happened. But I'm going to call yet, unless somebody else did, they didn't tell me yet, so. Yeah. So, Shirley, you had a uh, thought about, you know, how clowns or, or comedians or they're more or less the philosophers of our communities, and would you touch more, a little bit more base on that? Yeah, I've just been thinking about comedy and humor in the context of education and teaching people. So I've been reading a little bit, looking for, I guess, support for that theory. And, uh, you know, some, some tribes even have official columns, you know, they dress a certain way and they do a certain thing. And they are the philosophers. And, and they can go to the extreme uh, in seeing and doing things to make people laugh, but they're actually educating people at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so that was my question to you. Have you ever thought enough about your humor to think about the deepness of, hey, I could be educating people, or hey, I am educating people? Mm -hmm. and, and how that, how can that, in your role as a comedian, and, and I'm thinking a role model to a lot of young people, mm -hmm. do you ever think about how you could maybe drop a seed of thought in their mind to maybe do something in a different or better way? Um, for them as young people growing up when you're doing your comedy. Yeah. Well, I never really think of myself like that, but like like uh, we were talking earlier, Nicole brought up uh, how, how I am, uh, bring up certain things that uh, connect with people, that stick with people, and uh, these are just my everyday, you know, everyday things. But if I did start thinking like that, you know, that, that's something I, I, sh I really should be doing. No, I'm selfish and I just, <laughs> I'm a selfish man, so, but yeah, I, you know, I got kids coming up to me, they're, they they know what I do, and yeah. I'm starting to see that I'm uh, starting to become a role model, even though that's, that's not really why I got into this. Right. You know, the only ones that I'm worried about right now are my own kids, you know, what they're doing, and you know, I can't try to look like something I'm not in front of other people's kids, and, but uh, that's something that I really will have to start, you know, thinking more of. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's I, I like how um, people are, are really connecting to what I'm saying. Right. You know, you know, like just foster care. Nobody knew I was a foster parent until I, until I you know, got on stage. And, you know, one of my jokes, I didn't know I was a foster parent until a couple of weeks later. And I <laughs> asked them, well, when are these kids going home? <laughs> I said, well, those are ours now. I remember one joke that you, you spewed with, you know, as you were talking about, oh, well, maybe I am getting a little bit famous. And starting to recognize me. Mm -hmm. This young lady was following me around the store and she, I thought she wanted my autograph. And she just wanted to see if I wanted to buy some food stamps. <laughs> you know, it's, it's things like that. It's, it's reality in the Indian country. Yeah. That's actually happening. Yeah. It, it, that's, that's where it's at to me. You know, that's, it hits too close to home. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's funny. And somebody else might not think it's funny because, hey, it's illegal, but no. whatever. That's how we survive around here, man. You really do help out a family and yeah. if you buy, you know what I mean, you it's might buy pampers or something, yeah. whatever. It's the reality of being resilient and living in poverty. Mm -hmm. Where that, you know, poverty is, poverty is a full-time job in and of itself. Yeah. And it's, well, it's tough, so. Yeah, we were talking about, you know, like, uh, the commodities, how, how that was given to us from the government. And you know, they, they didn't expect us to turn it, expect us to turn it into what we did, you know. That's how fry bread was created and, you know, mac and cheese. It's not healthy for us, but we, we took what, what they gave us and made something out of it. Exactly. Can you imagine giving someone a, you know, a thing of flour and a, and a thing of lard? You know, what are you going to do with that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, mean, you, I imagine they sat on the table and they were looking at it for a long time, like, what can I do with this? Yeah. <laughs> and somebody had the vision of fry bread. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're loving it to this day, you know. Well, you know, it's almost, it's almost a delicacy for a non-native to go to a farm mm -hmm. and I'm going to get fry bread. Mm -hmm. yeah. The very product that was uh, against all odds at one point is the very reason that we survived. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, how, what does the future look like for you? Do, do you have, um, I know some people, they have managers and whatever, but it seems like every time I ask something of you, it's just you, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like you yeah. John and 
and, and like how does it, what is the process and what is the work and the challenges that go into booking gigs? Well, it's um, time really. You know, a lot of these other guys, they they don't have, a, you know, they're younger, so they don't have the family, they don't have the responsibility, they can get up and go whenever they feel like it to go meet somebody. And, you know, I'm, I'm at home right now with six kids married, I got a full-time job, and you know, my only way of getting getting our shows is through Facebook and uh, Twitter, sometimes Instagram. You know, I got my own website. I only got one hit on that one so far. And it's just, it's just word of mouth really is how I'm, how I'm trying to do it. You know, like YouTube, YouTube has been pretty, pretty helpful. Yeah, I would and, think YouTube would be yeah. a good. It's nice to have those social marketing yep. kind of things that's, out there that you can use for free. That's pretty yeah, much yeah. all I've been doing. Who knows, I sure might see your YouTube videos and maybe be a pop star, I know. <laughs> that's the dream. But I have a good hair though. <laughs> <laughs> you might be tuned in the KOJ. <laughs> Hair's a prerequisite, John. <laughs> that's the dream, man. But now, you know, now that I'm getting older, you know, I, I started out later than most of these younger guys. And, you know, I'm not getting any younger, not getting any, any better looking. And it's, pretty, and it's pretty much, I've always thought of myself as a behind the camera kind of, behind the scenes, behind the camera kind of guy, like writing and directing and stuff like that. So that's that's pretty much what I want to do. You know, that's right. At home, I started a video production business in 2006. I produced a few DVDs, you know, directed them, wrote them. So that's pretty, that's that's where I'm going right now. You know, but uh, for right now, I'm going to ride this comedy thing out as long as I can. And, and make some contacts and you know, try to get into filmmaking and writing. I've always wanted to write a book. I've been, I started my book in 1999. I've started old, started that book over about 11 times so far. So, mm -hmm. so it's just writing, and that's pretty much the, the dream. So is your, is your, what type of writing do you do? It's just uh, pretty much like what I talk about on stage. You know? Yeah. You know, they all say, if you want to be a writer, write what you know. I just uh, write. Res life because I've been here since I was four years old and you know, I grew up in Minneapolis the first two years of life and after that I've been pretty much a, a res boy. Yeah. That's all I know. So. Well it seems like it's been a both an honoring and a humbling experience for you. Because you're you're pretty humble. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd like to believe that after, you know, Clarence two toes and nine kinda of came out, it seems yeah. like you had the courage to come out and, and to put yourself out and to promote that. Mm -hmm. But it seems like ever since you had the courage to do that, mm -hmm. you influenced and given the courage and, um, mm -hmm. you know, you empowered other, other young men to do that. Mm -hmm. and, you know, look at, we have now, we have Sue Jones, we have yeah. Tino, we have Rob, we have mm -hmm. Stuart now, and, and there's a lot of other young people like mm -hmm. they, They're just naturally funny and, yeah. you know, it's yeah, just up to them to put Put like that. That's the biggest, the biggest barrier right there. Just getting out. I got like the friends I grew up with, and those, those are the funniest guys I've ever known in my life, man. But they just, they just will not take that step to get out there. Yeah. Like, I don't know what it is. No, I was like that too. I just figured I'm getting old, and I was gonna do something about it now. So yeah. and here I are. <laughs> <laughs> but right now we, um, we're talking about. I've seen out in the cities, I got a lot of uh, con contacts out in the cities, and they put together um, was it like award shows, like the little comedy groups put award shows together, and I was thinking, man, why doesn't the, the indigenous comedians have something like that? And they mm -hmm. put that idea out on Facebook, and you know, a, lot of the, a lot of the comedians I work with are into it, and right now we're just trying to get everybody together, what, what they ever worked for them, and it started out as like a, like an awards, but it's turning more into a like a festival now, you know, like a few day, two three day festival. But it's all about uh, honoring the late Charlie Hill. Mm -hmm. So you know, it'll be something something for him, and hopefully it's something that can, can catch on, make it a yearly thing, like you know, all the all the comedians I work with, because you know, I pretty much work with just about all of them, like Bon Eagle Bear, McMahon, and Tom Cummings, and Tito. Howie Miller, Mark Yaffe, Jim Rule, Miller Brown, Shoshonia, Tanya Jo Hall, she's another, mm -hmm. man, she, she's probably the funniest woman I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> Superman, Milo Redwater, J.R. Redwater, Chance Rush, and Ernie Sosie from 
found some of the alternative, all these guys mm -hmm. together in one venue to mm -hmm. you know, memory of uh, Charlie Hill. So that's hopefully that's coming up soon. So where, so, where, where is that going to be at? You guys have a uh, right location? now it, it, it'll be looking at looking at um some clients you know, up in uh, Red Lake. Awesome. Rest of Jordan and uh, put some. It sounds like a whole lot of fun to me. Yeah. And uh, well, like I said earlier, I try to get into writing, writing more, and I had this idea <coughs> of uh, you know, that movie 48 Hours with Eddie Murphy and Nick Nolte. Yeah. Yeah. I want to do one with me and Tatanka Means, we'll call it 49 Hours. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully, you know, I 49 and a half hours? 40, yeah. <laughs> hopefully, uh, well, I got to steal Microsoft Word from somewhere so I can type it out. Because so. <laughs> I don't pay for that. Man. Expensive. Yeah, that is, man. That's really Go expensive. into the, I mean, <coughs> I guess people don't really think about it, but explain to us, like, how, what goes into writing jokes. I mean, I could imagine that a lot of it's just you sit around with your buddies or whatever, because, like you said, they're the funniest people you know, and a lot of us would like to believe that we're hanging out with some of the funniest people we know. Mm -hmm. Because that's what brought you together. Yeah. So when you think about that and the the time and the thought and everything that goes into writing a joke, mm -hmm. I'm sure there's something in the back of your mind like, oh, I wonder if people are gonna laugh at this. Yes. That's probably a constant, <laughs> constant thought of yours. Yeah. Why don't you just kind of explain to us the, what that's like? Mm -hmm. Well, it's um, everything. It's what every joke I've ever performed. Yeah. I wrote it down. You know, I used to have a little uh, pen and paper. I carried it with me all the time. I put it next to my bed. If I thought of something, I'd write it down. You know, now it's, I, I got the, the new phone, so all my notes are on my phone. So if I lose my phone, my comedy career is over. <laughs> <laughs> and the interesting thing is, is that your your phone is in a, a Masio case, so you know, don't go anywhere in the fall time. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't drop it in the woods, or, anything, or else it's gone. Well, yeah, I just. Uh, Whatever comes to me at any moment, there were, when I first started out, I'd have good ideas. As, ah, I'll remember it. It's pretty, pretty funny. It's pretty good. I'll remember it. I'll write it down later. Later on, I forget all about it and I'm kicking myself that I forgot probably the greatest joke of all time that could put me in the mainstream. <laughs> but I started writing everything down. You know, think of growing up in Red Lake. You know, what I remember of growing up in the cities, going to school. You know, Hang out with all my cousins and uh, the res playing in the woods, no shoes on, all that stuff. All that stuff comes back to me. I, I don't know when because I rarely get alone time now because I got four of my own kids plus two foster kids. I work full time and you know, just that's why I care about home with me. It's like my uh, seventh child, <laughs> my favorite child. Not to mention you're married. That's like a part time. Pretty sure it is. It's a full time. 24-7. <laughs> oh, you, you care that much? <laughs> <laughs> you care enough to give it full time? <laughs> full time, yeah. I've been married for, uh, what is it? Uh oh. Well, you better know this number. Thir 13 and, over 13 and a half years, but we've been together for 20 now, so. Wow. So she's a very, very patient woman. <laughs> and I, I, I owe pretty much everything to her because of lets me do what I need to do. You know, she I, should be getting an award at that. Yes. <laughs> I will mention that to you. Know, you know, I, I do dishes every now and then, so that gives me some, some uh, currency right there. I get to go up, open mics. And, you know, she puts her foot down sometimes. Yeah. There was, I used to go out to open mics to like, you know, all over the place for no money at all. And, Take me like a uh, hundred bucks, two hundred bucks gas to get there and back, and she said, No, I can't do that anymore. So if you didn't pay for it now, you might as well be paid good for it. So. Well, you got time away from your family when you're doing stuff like that. That's, that's, uh, that's a good idea at, at first when you leave, but then when you get to where you're going, I get to somewhere right away. You know? yep. I'm going out to, to Idaho in December. Yeah, man, a couple of days out, I'm out to the family, out to kids, you know. First night there, I called home. <laughs> I was ready to go home. Every time I go somewhere, I'm like that. And then September, we went out to uh, I had a show in Washington, in Oregon, with uh, Jim Rule and Gilbert Brown. I figured, you know, we'll take the family out there. We said some lonesome all time. 
Yeah, you know, we hit those mountains in Montana as we were sending kids back. <laughs> that was really a good rid of them. But there's no really no in between. So. Yeah, it's joke writing. It's whatever I see every day. I write it down on the phone. Is there a, a flow that you think of when you put your performance together? Like, it's, it's got a flow this way, or is it just kind of whatever it comes to? Well, I, I try to. I have my list of jokes like this year. Mm -hmm. I look at my notes and I just write them down. Keep writing, you know, write down what I have ready. Yeah. And then I think of what works, what'll stick, and I keep writing. Just keep. It helps me remember it. You know, I still take my notes up there. And I try to put them in order, what will work, what will yeah. help me remember the next one. And just constantly writing pen and paper. That's my uh, biggest thing right now. I have to admit, I've never seen, um, other than Nicole's wedding, any of your performances, but, you know, do you, when you're out there, how often do you capitalize on something humorous or someone humorous that you see in the audience or something that, you know? Yeah, well, if, I, if I'm having trouble getting to another joke, that's when I'll, if I see something, I'll, you know, I'll just you know, toy with them for a little bit until something comes to me. And same thing, if I forget something else, I just go right back to what I see out there. You know, that, that's the thing about comedy. People want to be, they want to be involved in the show. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I haven't, I haven't had a heckler yet, so um, I've been preparing for that since I first started, and I got some good, some good zingers for the heckler. <laughs> I haven't gotten one yet. I don't know if it's because I look too mean or what, but nobody's bothered with me yet. So, but yeah, I just like interacting with the crowd. You know, they're there to have fun, and that's the, the most important thing you can. I yeah. always thought that was the best part of, like, I remember watching Kings of Comedy. That was, that's still one of my favorite movies. Yeah, I love that. I, I watched that, like, I don't know, religiously when I was a kid. Like, yeah. seriously, I was like, everybody's like, you're gonna watch that again? I was like, yeah, I know I'd be yeah. lying, but yeah. it's like, funny just as the first time you watched yeah. it. But the part where D.L. Hughley's on there, he's just improv and the crowd, like, mm -hmm. picked out what was, like, like, memorably stupid hair or something yeah. or memorably yeah. dumb jacket or something he would he, he capitalized on it and that's what comedy's at yeah. that's where it's at that's true skill and true art there definitely mm -hmm. is an art to, to comedy yeah. to be able to think of something like that and to to make people laugh in such a big capacity and it's it's always my favorite part so when you when you guys are at these shows and you're tapping on people in the front of the audience it's the best part yeah. Like, I don't want that to see how <laughs> I always make sure I'm in the 6th yeah. or 7th because you guys can't see yeah. that part. <laughs> I, I try to invite people to my shows and they don't want to come to some of these. Maybe setting them up. Yeah. Well, you know, if I get, you know, like, if I get run into trouble with remembering my jokes, then, you know, I'll go after it. None of my relatives are like, I have a lot of jokes about my dad and my cousins and they don't want to come anymore. So, so does your mom, I have to ask you this, does your mom really come to your shows? Yep. Because you're always... Yeah, she's been there just about every yeah. one. You know, always apologizing for the nasty yeah. jokes, and she's I, like right there. <laughs> first, first, first two rows, yeah, she's always right there. I, I, I know she's there, but I get into the zone when I'm on stage, and you know, one of those one of those inappropriate jokes come up, and I think, oh man, my mom's out there. Talk like that in front of my mom. That's, uh, that's, that is true. She that's that's really nice that she comes and supports yeah. you like that. She, uh, one of my shows, I think it might have been my second one. I know I brought her up there. I didn't bring her up. I was talking about her, and I was like, ah, I'm sorry, my I love you, mom. And background, I love you too, son. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't sit up front. No, she was worried about you picked that. She was right in the back. And I was like, I'm going to shut up, mom. It's so my show. <laughs> Kind of horny. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're when you're up there, I have to mention because you talk about how nervous you are, but you never come off nervous. Mm -hmm. And you, like, if you do, you play it off real well. But I remember there was this one this one time in Red Lake, and you were you were leading up to what was I think was supposed to be a big joke, and it like must have backfired because you're like. Okay, that wasn't funny. And then like everybody like burst into laughter because we realized how funny it was. But it just kind of like bypassed everybody. But it seems like those are some of the best jokes too. Yeah. You know, it's like 
it was it was pretty glorious. Yeah, that's the thing. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how, but I'm able to capitalize on the misfires of my jokes, and I don't know if it's just the way, the way it comes out or what. And I just uh, those are those are the lucky ones. That I, <laughs> lucky, lucky to laugh. So. Redeem. Redeem myself. Yeah. Yeah. Remember laughing at you, even though I was laughing at you. With me. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, at the close wedding, there, there's this nerdy table of natural resource people. Mm -hmm. We work in natural resources and. We were sitting there and we were kind of um, frustrated with the fact that, you know, all those, there was a bunch of purple flowers, I don't know if you remember them right now, but all over there was purple flowers. Well, it's an invasive species called spotted napoli. Mm -hmm. And we're like, geez, I wonder if these people know that, you know, they should be getting rid of these or whatever. And then, you know, right about the time we had this conversation, he said, oh my God, I just feel like I'm in heaven standing up here in all these beautiful <laughs> purple flowers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping heaven doesn't have spotted that way. <laughs> I remember that people were winding up and taking pictures and it's like, these guys are like cringing and closing their faces. And like, My buddy was like, oh, it's all I can do to sit here. I want to go start pulling them off. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's funny. 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 Yeah,
Beautiful drive. Yeah. Always beautiful snow in April. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> so thank you, Miigwech. Oh, and I got one more thing. Um, you know, the music thing is working out for everybody. And I'm going to start my own band. And we go John Boogie and the Rippers. <laughs> I'll be on the lookout for that. I'll be watching. What kind of music is that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> genre is that? Oh, I, I need a band first. I got two guitar players. That's it. So you and your buddies? Yeah, me and my buddies jam session. Maybe which John? Yeah.